Well, we're going to go ahead and take a look at an overview of World War II together. Just to remind you of how we got a little bit of to uh, where we're at World War II, we might, you might remember we talked about Russia going through a communist revolution, the Russian Revolution. You might remember the guy who led the Russian Revolution was this guy, Vladimir Lenin. He was a hero who believed in Marxism or communism, where you want to take the wealth from the rich and you want to give it to the poor. You want to redistribute the wealth. And that's what Lenin argued for on the right. He was so loved that they actually preserved his body and it's actually still on display to this day. Lenin was perceived as a man who was getting rid of the rich, getting rid of the kings. He was sweeping the world clean of this, but Lenin would not live forever and he would in fact have a replacement. His replacement is Joseph Stalin. On the handout, Joseph Stalin took over leadership of Russia after the death of Lenin. And so he's the next leader. And as far as goals is concerned, his key goal on your handout, industrialization, was a key goal. You might remember that Russia was relatively backwards. And he wanted to change all that. And so uh, what he did was that he went ahead and he argued that we need to have an industrialized Russia, that that would be key and that would be important. It says on the handout that in addition to that, uh, it was not, he wasn't building industry for consumer goods like the United States, but instead for military strength. And so again, consumer goods are, are things like, you know, um, televisions or cars or, or things that the people would want or people would would utilize and that is not what Joseph Stalin was in fact about. In fact, he's going to be arguing for industry. It says he had a centralized government that had these so-called five-year plans and that basically the goal is every five years they would make advances and the goal included having five times the amount of electricity they had before. And the goals included having two times the heavy industry as they had before. The goals resulted in cities being created, it says on your handout from scratch. These are some of the things that Joseph Stalin accomplished in his day and his time. And so definitely he wants to make Russia better than it had been. Now, another thing Joseph Stalin wants to work on is something on your handout called collectivization. And so basically, Russia, before the communist revolution, before the Russian revolution, there were small family owned farms that were transformed into massive government run. You'll write down the word collectives. Basically, as you might remember, they wanted to redistribute the wealth and redistributing the wealth in this instance means taking land away from rich peasants or peasants that owned the land and it was thought to be they were just being selfish for owning the land and that what you need to do is take the land and you're going to have these collective farms equally owned by the people and it says on the handout the government was now in charge of what food and how much food was produced it's not individuals making those choices about what you'll grow or how much you're ch you'll charge it's the government that will decide how much food is produced. And as you can imagine, wealthier peasants, the, the most successful farmers, resisted giving up their property. You know, people argue that I worked hard for this, that this is mine, that, you know what, we weren't uh, given anything for free. We worked for all we have, and I'm not ready to give what I have to the government. In fact, it says on the handout that some of these wealthier peasants actually destroyed their own property rather than have the government profit from it. And so that's exactly what we see here. Um, they would much rather um, just, you know, destroy their own property than have, you know, the, the, the new Russian uh, government come in and, um, and profit off of them. And so these people, Lenin had to deal with these people as well. And Lenin had argued that these people are traitors, these people are basically vampires. And what do we do with these people who resist? Well, 
It says Stalin's response, he had 8 million arrested. These people were thrown in jail, and sadly, they were starved to death. And that's devastating because you know who these people that Stalin arrested for saying no were? They were the best farmers. And now we just literally lost the best farmers in Russia. It says the least effective farmers the, were the only ones left. You know, the ones that weren't good at their jobs, they didn't complain because they were actually going to benefit from this redistribu re redistribution of the wealth. And so now with all the good farmers gone, all the good farmers arrested or killed, you have all the bad farmers left, and they're the ones in charge. As a result, what happens when bad farmers are in charge? It says on the handout, there was bad harvest, there was high government demand that these farmers could never meet. And as a result, in 1934, there was a famine, you'll write down, that killed five million people. This was not a famine based on, on bad weather. This was not a famine based on lack of, of rain. This was a famine based on mismanagement. This was a famine caused by communism. Five million people died. And even though this is a setback, Stalin will continue with these so-called five-year plans, making goals to better Russia every step along the way. And it says on the handout that the second five-year plan, machinery, you know, the making of machines and factories went up 14 times. And so there are things that the, the Soviet communist system does well and things the Soviet communist system does not do well. Feeding their people, the Soviet communist system does not do that well. Making tanks and making machines and having factories, that's something they do pretty well. But even though machinery goes up 14, 14 times, it says on the handout, there was very few consumer goods. A consumer good, which there was very few of, includes things like clothing and things like food for consumption. Just not a lot of choices. And we'll see this as a continuing theme in, in communist nations. So very few consumer goods like food and clothing. The next section says terror and opportunities. Well, it turns out that there's a lot of, of rumors in the Soviet Union, and rumors could get you arrested or killed. In fact, it says on the handout, in 1933, one million members of the Communist Party were accused of being what's called counter-revolutionary. And these one million people were arrested and kicked out of the Communist Party. And so... This is very similar to the French Revolution. These were people accused of not being revolutionary enough. And so we have these things called purges, where even high-level high level communist officials who may have been considered threats by Stalin were arrested. In fact, Stalin didn't want any rivals or anyone who was more popular than him. It says eight of his best and high, most highly-ranked generals were actually executed. <clears throat> um, in fact, um, here's um, Stalin. You can see Stalin. Uh, there's these three leaders sitting down. Churchill was the leader of the British. In the middle was our president, Franklin Adelo Ro Adelino Roosevelt. And on the far right, Joseph Stalin. You can see Stalin dressed like a military man. Stalin not looking happy, not looking like glad to be part of this group but he was a reluctant friend and ally of the British in the United States. When we talk about Stalin getting rid of people who were rivals, here's this famous example. Here's Stalin in the center with the Soviet official on the right, his left. And this Soviet official ran afoul of Stalin. And so Stalin, instead of wanting this guy to come up in photographs and pictures and people saying, oh, well, you know, you used to hang out with this guy. How bad could he be? Look at what Stalin had done. Stalin literally wiped these people out from official records and newspapers as if sometimes they didn't even exist. In fact, on the handout, eight of his best, most highly decorated generals were executed. And so even if you were high ranking, that would not save you from death. And it says on the handout that confession often came with torture. So it was true that some people said, yes, I confess, I was plotting against Stalin, I, I fought against Stalin. But a lot of these 
confessions, they were only the product of torture, not real confessions of guilt. It says on the handout that real or imagined crimes um, often sent people to a place called the Gulag, where eight million Russians were sent. So eight million people were sent to these 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 uh, prison camps called the Gulag, and a lot of these people were not guilty. They may have uh, confessed to crimes under torture, but many are believed were just rivals or felt like they weren't revolutionary enough, definitely has a reign of terror feel. And so what happens, what could possibly be good about 8 million people in jail or dead? Well, it says on the handout, with my neighbor dead or imprisoned, you'll write down there was more jobs. And this is like an odd thing because the rest of the world is going through a Great Depression. And Stalin could say, you know what, while the U.S. and the British and the capitalist countries are going through a Great Depression, Russia is not. Look at all these jobs. But these jobs only exist because this guy, Stalin, literally put millions in jail or in the grave. And so um, at some level, Stalin can be popular for, for the, the uh, amount of jobs available. It says on the handouts in the 1930s, the industrial leaders of the world were the U.S., Germany, and the USSR. And that's impressive. In fact, it says on the handout, the USSR had rapid industrialization, that Russia under Joseph Stalin had become a top three industrial power. Factories is one of the things that communism does right and does well. In fact, it says they did relatively well during the Great Depression. Speaking of the Great Depression, here is a famous photograph of this woman. She's clearly stressed out. Her, her children are around her. Their clothes have holes in it. And a lot of people have tried to guess how old this woman is. And many people often guess, well, she looks like she's in the 40s or maybe her early 50s based on the stress and the lines on her face. But she's actually only 32 years old. And that's because of the things she saw and experienced in the Depression aged her prematurely. It says on the handout, in 1929, we see something called the stock market crash. And as a result of the stock market crash, the stocks lost, you'll write down, half of their value. So companies and corporations sell stock in Wall Street in New York City and other places and for various reasons, the stock market crashed and people who invested in the stock market lost some of them their entire savings. In fact, it says on the handout, consumers with little money resulted in, in, in a cut in business production. Millions were laid off. Some men will write down even abandon their families. You know, some men looking at the stress of having to feed wife and children with no job. Sadly, we see thousands of men just literally walk away, abandoning their families. And by 1932, unemployment reached 25 percent, where one out of every four people looking for a job could not find it. This is the worst financial disaster we have ever experienced as a nation. The U.S. banks demanded repayment from Europe, which further damaged their economies. You might remember World War One. we actually lent a whole bunch of money to Europe. So when things go bad here, our banks call up Europe, say, hey, it's time to pay back your loans. They didn't have that money, so Europe goes into depression as well. Some countries were able to weather the Great Depression better than others. It says on the handout that the colonies of, the, the colonies of empires like Britain and France were forced to buy European products, and that did help these nations get through the Great Depression. But countries like Japan and Germany, well, they suffered the most. And that's one of the reasons they're going to be looking for, uh, that's one of the reasons Germany is going to be looking for revenge after World War I. They feel that the punishments of World War I, you might remember that World War I blamed Ger Germany for the cause of the war. You might remember that the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I actually asked for something called reparations, which meant that Germany had to pay for the entire cost of World War I. And so with the Great Depression, this is an opportunity 
for people in Germany to say, uh, I think we would like revenge. Now, at, at our time, we have a president who is seeking to lead us out of the Great Depression. Here's his picture on the right. His name is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR for short. And he had a plan for relief. In fact, he planned massive government spending. He thought, well, what we'll do is we'll just spend a lot of money. We'll create government jobs and people will work for the government. His plan of spending and relief was called the New Deal. And traditionally, people argue most People are taught that the New Deal got us out of the Depression, but actually that is a big debate. In fact, a recent or a study back in 1995 asked economists, did the New Deal actually help or prolong the Great Depression? And you'll write down that 49% of econom economists believe the New Deal actually prolonged it. So instead of letting the government, um, you know, um, capitalism would say the government should get out of the way. And that is what about half of economists say. Half say, oh, yeah, for sure, the government getting involved helped. And the other half say it did not help. So it says depression in non-industrialized countries, countries in Latin America and Asia that exported raw materials to industrial nations. They were definitely hurt with a drop in sales. And it says that Latin American nations during the Great Depression were taken over by military officials who promised solutions. And this is really how you get dictators. You get dictators who say, hey, stick with me. I'm gonna give you jobs. I'm gonna provide for you. It's going to be okay. Well, one dictator who definitely promises his country a lot is Benito Mussolini. And under the section, the rise of fascism, Mussolini's Italy, well, he wanted a restoration of power and prestige. He wanted to bring Italy back. You might remember Italy was a relatively new country. It didn't even exist in the 1870s, but it didn't do well in like the scramble for Africa. You might remember they famously lost in an invasion of Ethiopia. And it says that it's at this time that Benito Mussolini and his fascist party took over Italy. And fascism, it does two things. It says it glorified war and Italian nationalism. Nationalism's intense pride in your country. And what he wants to do is say, you know what, by us going to war, by us beating up others, by us creating an empire, we are creating our glory years all over again. And the key is this idea that the leader is always right, that you don't question the leader. We see actually in Italy mass communication and propaganda to control the people. People would have flyers and posters everywhere that would say the leader, Benito Mussolini, is always right. And his desire was to basically rebuild the Roman Empire. He wanted to bring Italy back to the glory days. And looking at a map of Africa, he decided there's yet one major area left to invade and that was Ethiopia. But this time, Mussolini led to the invasion that was deemed relatively successful. In, in 1935, he invaded and took over Ethiopia. And so there you see an early fascist flexing his muscles. We also have another fascist flexing his muscles, and that's Adolf Hitler. And let's talk about what causes Adolf Hitler to come into power. Well, after World War I, you might remember that Germany was punished by having to pay for the cost of the war. And after World War I, there was a brief period of time where there was a government called the Weimar Republic. And this is a German government. And you're going to write down that they suffered from what's called hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is where the value of your money begins to skyrocket and it basically becomes meaningless. Here you have children playing with stacks of million dollar bills that are basically worth nothing because Germany owed so much. They printed money to pay their bills and their money became essentially worthless. People would have to have wheelbarrows of money to go buy bread. We see hyperinflation in other countries like Zimbabwe, an African country that also tried to print their way out of debt. 
And you can see here is a $100 trillion bill as an example of how bad hyperinflation can be. Well, with hyperinflation, it says it was at this time we see Adolf Hitler come in. And Adolf Hitler, he wrote a book, the Nazi party wrote a book called Mein Kampf, which means my struggle. He had a belief in a so-called master race where he ranked different Europeans. The, the best Europeans were the Aryans. These are people from Germany and Scandinavia. That's like Sweden and Britain. He also believed after them was an Alpine race is where the French and the Italians were. The third lowest white people were Russians and Eastern Europeans. Sometimes collectively these people are called Slavic. But who were the lowest type of white people and the lowest type of people in general perhaps you'll write down were the Jews. And this is to some degree an application of something we've talked about before, before called social Darwinism, which is the idea that you can rank humans from more advanced to less advanced. And this basically is the belief that there is some sort of survival of the, of the fittest that would require conquest and death. Well, Adolf Hitler looked around the neighborhood and decided what, what they needed to bring Germany back from where they were is they needed some, some breathing room. They needed to expand at the expense of their neighbors, including a neighbor like Poland. And it's here that Hitler, with his plan to bring Germany back, to get revenge on those who betrayed Germany, in his mind at least, that the Reichstag, the German parliament, gave authority and the title of the Fuhrer, which is this leader. And he declares the creation of a Third Reich. A Third Reich means like a Third Empire. And how do we get to the Third Reich? The First Reich was the Holy Roman Empire. The Second Reich was under Bismarck, who was the guy who actually unified Germany in the 1870s. And now we have this so-called Third Reich, which he said would last for, you'll write down, a thousand years. And this whole thousand years of glory, of goodness, should remind you that this is an example of millenarian thinking. We talked about how during the Boxer Rebellion, the Chinese thought there'd be this millennium, this, this period of peace, and so did the ghost dancers of the Native Americans. Millenarianism is this belief we're in the end times or a time of transition and a golden age is around the corner. And that's what Hitler thought with his Third Reich supposedly lasting a thousand years in the future. And he had some successes. In fact, he turned the economy around quickly. So in 1933, Adolf Hitler bails on the League of Nations. He ignored the Treaty of Versailles and he built up his army. That's what he wasn't supposed to do. The Treaty of Versailles ended World War I. It said Germany can't have an army. And Hitler says, well, I'm just going to do it anyway. What are you going to do about it? Well, the answer is nothing. Because a lot of countries thought if we say no to Hitler, he's going to start fighting us. What if we just give him what he wants? I'm sure everything's going to be okay. And there's a name for giving Hitler what he wants. It's called appeasement. There was the belief that it's better not to challenge Germany. Giving Hitler what he wanted would allow peace. And so they thought, you know what? He wants an army. No big deal. Let's have an army. How bad could things get? Well, what about us? What about the United States? Well, for us, it says we embraced isolationism. We didn't want to get involved with European affairs. You know what? Americans thought we fought World War I. Maybe we shouldn't have done that. This is really a Europe problem. This is not a United States problem. And this belief that we should do our own thing, we should be isolated, we should turn to American issues first is called isolationism. And that's really where we're at. But we're going to see more and more events pull the United States into World War II. It says in 1935, as I mentioned before, Ethiopia was taken over by Italy. And at this point, the Ethiopian emperor, a man named Haile Selassie, actually spoke at the League of Nations. And he said that if they didn't act, then other countries would be invaded. Haile Selassie, the black emperor of Ethiopia, stood up at the League of Nations and said, if you League of Nations, you might remember the League of Nations was this almost like the United Nations. It was a, a club of all countries in the world. 
it was supposed to be a place where you could talk out your problems. And the emperor of Ethiopia said, hey, um, we're literally being invaded by Benito Mussolini. We're being invaded by the Italians. If you, the League of Nations, don't stand up for us, others in this room will be next. And that was a prophetic warning because that is exactly what happened. He warned the League of Nations other countries would be invaded. And it says on the handout, the League of Nations ignored the warning. They didn't do anything. The League of Nations was not effective in stopping World War II. One of the reasons you might remember is that, well, the United States, one of the most powerful nations in the, in the world, didn't even join the League of Nations. How effective is a group like the League of Nations going to be when one of the most important countries doesn't join it? So he bails on the League and says, you know what, I'm just going to build an army. I'm going to do whatever I want. As a result, it says the League of Nations ignored the warning and neighboring Austria was annexed, which means taken over. And then Adolf Hitler starts looking around the map of Europe and saying, what do I want and what can I get away with without people really telling me? At a place called the Munich Conference, it was decided that a part of Czechoslovakia would be actually given to Adolf Hitler. There was a part of Czechoslovakia called the Sudetenland and they spoke German there, and so it was agreed that the Allies would give Hitler the German-speaking part of this country. And so they didn't really ask Czechoslovakia. They thought, well, you know what, they, they speak German there, let him have it, I'm sure he'll be fine. But as you can imagine, once you give a bully something, it's never, never going to be enough. This was such a miscalculation that appeasement would work, appeasement giving Hitler what he wants, that Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Britain, after agreeing to give up parts of Czechoslovakia to Hitler said, I have just secured, quote, peace in our time. And actually, Neville Chamberlain couldn't be more wrong. You don't give a bully what he wants and expect that he's going to be done. Well, this bully of Hitler made an agreement with another pretty terrible government, the Soviets. We just talked about Stalin killing millions of his own people. And the Nazis said, well, let's be friends, you know. And so we have what we call the Nazi-Soviet pact. They, they agreed to friendship and promised to divide Poland between themselves. Here we have a map. Everything in pink or red and orange is everywhere the, the Nazi empire will extend. And we're going to kind of explain how we get here, but you see right away how successful, with everything in orange and red or pink, how successful they were. It says uh, the World War II starts officially in 1939 with Hitler invading Poland. It was not prepared for this at all. This is the official start of World War II. And Hitler used a tactic known as Blitzkrieg, which literally means lightning war. In football today, you hear the term blitzing the quarterback. It means coming in as quickly as possible to tackle the quarterback before he can do anything. And Blitzkrieg was where the Germans have tanks. They have these so-called mechanized army that can move in like lightning before a country can resist. And so within a year, the Axis powers, which was the name of Germany's relationship with Italy, the access, you can see how they make like a, a line through the middle of Europe, they controlled most of Europe. Everything in orange on the map, vast amounts of territory controlled by Adolf Hitler. In resistance to Nazi Germany, we'll write down that Great Britain stood alone. Because actually, in the beginning of the war, you might remember the Soviets were technically friends with Germany. And really, the only important power on the planet staying true and independent were the British. And so for about a year, they're the only country on the planet resisting Adolf Hitler. Hitler tried to destroy Britain in what you'll write down was called the Battle for Britain. The Battle for Britain. Every night they were bombed. V-2 rockets, which are the first long-distance rockets launched from Europe to England. Nightly bombing raids. People had to hide in the subway lines while the bombs fell. This was called the Battle for Britain. It says, and finally on this section, we have the Allies. We have to the far left Winston Churchill, the leader of the British, 
we have in the middle FDR, our own president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the unhappy Joseph Stalin. We're going to Japan now, on the other side of the world. You might remember Japan had gone through something called the Meiji Restoration, where the most important thing you should know about this is Japan had quickly modernized. Meiji equals modernization. Here you can see they're dressed like Europeans. And there was a lot the Japanese could boast were the results of modernization. You might remember in 1904 they defeated Russia. And basically they wanted to be like Europe and have, you'll write down, an empire. If European countries had empire, Japan wants the same. And so what happens is they look to the weakest country in their neighborhood, which you might recall is China, and invade. In 1937, Japan wanted to take advantage of a weakening China. And so they, they took advantage of a weakening China. And one of the most horrific things that occurs is how the Japanese treated China. Uh, here you have this map. And you can see everything in white is the Pacific Ocean, blue are the allies, and pink or red is the lands that the Japanese took over. And it's substantive. It's, it's a lot, like a third of China taken over. And there's a name for this terrible invasion of China. We call it the Rape of Nanjing. Uh, it says on the hand of the Rape of Nanjing here, Japanese soldiers killed. 250,000 Chinese. And so there is a, a lot of, of, of hurt and, and a lot of history between China and Japan. A quarter million Chinese, many of them civilians, killed. And sadly, tens of thousands of women were raped. And so the Japanese trying to flex their muscles and look like Europeans by building an empire. And they did. They conquered all these things in red, including American possessions like Guam. Uh, this is definitely going to be a problem. There's also the international aspect of the war. Not only do we see the Chinese and the Japanese, but here we see soldiers from in France in 1944. These are Indian soldiers, and you might remember India is part of the British Empire and they join in the fighting effort. In fact, Indian soldiers served in the British Army. How many? How many Indians served in the British Army? You'll write down 2.5 million Indians. In fact, one British general once said, we could never have won World War II without the Indian Army with us. So as India was ruled by the British, 2.5 million served. So how do we compare World War II to other wars? Well, you might remember that by comparison, World War I had once been called the war to end all wars. In that war, we saw 10 million people die. That was horrific. That was tragic. But take a look at World War II deaths, and you'll see that this World War I, though it was terrible, would not be the war to end all wars. Doing the best of the major countries was the United States. And doing the best means we have 418,000 dead Americans. It's huge numbers. But compared to everyone else who was a major fighter, not much at all. Japan saw the death of 3 million of their people. Germany, the for sure initiator of World War II, saw 7 million dead. But then we see other parts of the world with some interesting numbers. We see that Ethiopia, you might remember, having been invaded by Italy, saw 100,000 dead in East Africa here and Ethiopia here. Ethiopian soldiers picking up the guns that they captured from the Italian invaders. The Philippines, we see half a million Filipinos as it seems like they can never catch a break. Half a million died. And then we also see shocking numbers from India, because part of India this time was a region called Bengal. Left to join the British Army. Partly the British did not send relief because the British were in charge of India. They were in charge of Bengal. And in India, in this famine, Bengal, you'll write down, two million people died. 
We also see everything in yellow was the Dutch East Indies and took that over from the Dutch. And we see three million people die in the yellow region. It's listed here as Borneo, Java, Sumatra. Three million died here. And then yet again, China, look at these numbers. 20 million people died in China. These are huge numbers. The Soviet Union, we see 24 million in the Soviet Union. And then we have some numbers that, but at least the total battle deaths are something like 15 million. And at least the total civilian death tolls are 45 million. It's hard to tell. In fact, many people will say we, we just don't know. Going back to Europe, how does the war end up? Well, eventually with the United States joining the war because of Pearl Harbor, it's only a matter of time. Germany forever with the U.S. coming in on the side of the British. And the liberation of France begins at an invasion called D-Day. You can see France and that northern beach with facing London is called the Normandy Beaches. And the liberation of France is called D-Day. On the east, there is the farthest city on the east. There's a city called Stalingrad. And the turning point of the war in the east was Stalingrad, where in total there was two million casualties. And so now we have the Russians working to push the Nazis back on the east, the Americans, French, and British working to push the Nazis back from Iwo Jima. And this one battle, Japan, well, they lost, you'll write down, 21 soldiers. And the amount of wounded Marines on Iwo Jima, 19,000. These are ridiculous numbers. invasion and the low end people said we will at the very least lose a hundred thousand so the question is is there an alternative 